So can you believe it? We have Will Rogers with us this morning. I thought he died in 1935, but I guess I'm wrong because he's here. Will Rogers never met a man he didn't like, and everyone likes Will Rogers. He is known as a movie star, a writer, a radio commentator, and a professional speaker. He pokes fun at Congress, and he jokes with presidents. In the early part of the 1900s, Will Rogers was our best known American. He was a legend and his legacy endures. His wit and wisdom are still fresh. We're going to experience Will Rogers as he was in the 1920s and 30s. But be alert, he will also talk about our world today in 2020. Let's welcome Will Rogers. Thank you. Just make sure the sound is coming through okay. Everybody fine? All Perfect. Right. Much obliged. Thanks, Patricia. Now, to all of you, come with me to the Curran Theater at 445 Gary Street, there between Taylor and Mason. It's May the 1st. 1934, and I'm ready for opening night of that famous play called Ah Wilderness. Now, now I'm playing the role of, a, of the newspaper owner, Nat Miller, I'm, and I'm nervous. I'm nervous because this is a play, and I'm expected to recite the words exactly as Eugene O'Neill wrote them. Uh, see, I've been talking on stage and giving speeches for years and on CBS and NBC radio uh, for 15 minutes on Sunday nights, but this is this time. There's no there's no ad living. Uh, even even in the movies, if I change a line and if the people on the set laugh at it, why the director may leave it in, or otherwise they just uh, shoot it again and until uh, I get it acceptable. But when Mr. O'Neill writes the script, you better get it exactly the way he wrote it. And and in a play, no one no one can yell cut and back up and do it over again. Um, so I'm in this famous all wilderness play almost every night for three weeks there in San Francisco. And that meant I had plenty of time to check out the city and, and the surrounding territory uh, during the day. <laughs> On uh, one off day, I even drove down to the Hearst Ranch at San Simeon and spent some time out on the range with the Cowboys. Uh, well, since I was there in San Francisco, in my daily newspaper column, I, I wrote a few lines you might be interested in. Uh, here's, here's one of them. Uh, when a Los Angeles guy comes up here to San Francisco, it's just a country boy going to town. You have to, you have to stake, take your spurs off when you get here. Uh, another one, cities are born, not made. You're either a city or you're not. I bet that San Francisco was a city from the first time it has a dozen settlers. Uh, size has nothing to do with it. Uh, New York is yokel, <laughs> but San Francisco is a city. <laughs> I even noticed that uh, even today your NBA uniforms have the word city uh, on them. Uh, all right, that was in May. And just a couple of months later in July, 1934, I was back with my wife and we were on a boat heading to Hawaii and then on to Japan and China. So I, here's something I wrote. I said, uh, just steaming out of the beautiful San Francisco Bay, uh, they're putting a bridge across it. They'll build a bridge to Honolulu if the government don't run out of credit. Uh, this, this town is going through a wild orgy of bridge building. Uh, you don't dare leave a few buckets of water out overnight or by morning somebody will build a bridge over it. <laughs> now, what you need in San Francisco is not a bridge, it's an overcoat. <laughs> well, you, you, probably, you probably heard me say a few times, I never met a man I didn't like, uh, right? Uh, I know a few of you have heard that quote. Uh, or you'll hear someone say, well, that Will Rogers claimed he never met a man he didn't like, but I never, 
I bet he never met so-and-so, uh, blankety blank. Uh, or they'll change it. They might say, uh, Senator so-and-so never met a tax he didn't like. Uh, well, uh, before this morning ends, before the end of the, my presentation here in a few minutes, I'll, I'll update that quote and, and I'll tell you what I meant by it. And, and I think you'll like it too. Uh, well, another one you've heard, I'm sure is all I know is what I read in the newspaper, but, but really uh, we learn by two things. Now one is reading and the other is associating with smarter people. Now, now, that's why this breakfast club has been around for 80 years. And I'm glad to see my friend uh, Craig Harrison on here with us this morning. Uh, but really, uh, we're all ignorant. We're just ignorant on different subjects. I said one time, there's, there's nothing as stupid as an educated man when you get him off the subject he was educated in. And in all the years I've repeated that, I've never had a woman ever disagree. Well, and if I was there in person, I would get out my, my lasso and, and we'd do a little bit of uh, roping, be a very little bit. And after I did that, I'd get four or five of you up uh, out of the audience and, and have you spin on some trick ropes also. That's, that's always fun when, when we're doing this in person, but since we don't have that opportunity, and I think Tony already sent this out in an email, there's a, a great silent movie on uh, YouTube that you can check out. And if you don't have that link, just go on YouTube and it's a very simple search. Just type in Will Rogers. And then the name of the movie is The Ropin Fool, R-O-P-I-N, uh, Fool. Uh, the whole silent film is 19 minutes, or you can choose a shorter version. It's a, a three minute portion of it. And, uh, and all of it has narration that's been added by Will Rogers Jr. So, uh, so it's good. Now, if I, if I get to meet with you in person sometime, I, uh, I'll invite a few of you up to spin ropes with me, especially Sydney. I think he'd be great. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, in 1932, I learned the secret of success in the cattle business, and I'm going to share it with you. Well, well you, may, you may be wondering, I'm in San Francisco. Why do I care about cattle? <laughs> unless, unless maybe you're offspring of William Randolph Hearst. Um, I heard a rumor, and Craig can confirm this later, I heard a rumor that Craig Adams is related to Hearst. And he, he's agreeing. Yeah, I thought maybe it was fake news, but that sounds uh, sounds great. Maybe we'll hear more about him afterwards. Well, and for all of you, when it comes time to pay your California taxes, you just might decide to move to Oklahoma and get into the cattle business. Uh, well, I was I was on the W.T. Wagner Ranch down in Vernon, Texas. Now, picture this: six hundred thousand acres and twenty five thousand head of cattle. Now, Mr. Wagner was one cow man that was smart enough to solve the low price of cattle and, and make ranch and pay. And here's the way he did it. Every cow had her own oil well. <laughs> now, now, I was raised on a cattle ranch and I never saw or heard of a rancher ever going broke except the ones that had borrowed money. You, you just can't break a man that don't borrow. He, uh, he, may not, he may not have anything, but he can look the world in the face and say, I don't know, you birds a nickel. Well, you might be wondering if the farmers and the ranchers and the rest of us stop borrowing money, uh, what's a banker gonna do? Well, let them go to work if there's any job they can earn a living at. <laughs> Banking and this after dinner speaking that I do or after breakfast uh, are two of the most non-essential industries we have in this country. <laughs> and, and I'm ready to reform if they are. Uh, well, when I, when I was taking those jabs at the bankers, it was back in the 1920s and it was almost mainly or almost exclusively the banks back on the East Coast that were causing the problems. Let me give you an idea of just how bad it was. In uh, 1923, the bankers were holding their national convention in New York and I was there with the Ziegfeld Follies and they invited me. Now, I don't know, I don't know why they invited me, but they did. Uh, to speak at, a, at one of their luncheons. 
I won't give you the whole talk, but let me just give you a, a line or two. I said, you have a fine organization. I understand you have 10,000 here. And if you count the ones in the various federal prisons, it brings your total membership up to around 30,000. Well, the uh, fact is the bankers <laughs> did reform, at least temporarily, but, but I never did. I just, I just kept on speaking. Uh, well, speaking of borrowing and saving, one time in my syndicated newspaper column, I wrote about a farmer in Claremore named uh, Morris Haas. <laughs> and here's what I wrote. <clears throat> he took $500 in bills and he hid them out in the barn in a barrel of bran. And yesterday a cow got into it and ate it all up. He's only been able to get $18 of it back <laughs> up to now. <laughs> well, and, and the New York Times published that. I, uh, I kind of doubt if they even knew what it meant. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Haas kept that old cow in her, in her private stall for a couple more days uh, just to see what he might get out of her. Oh, uh, how, how would you like to be the one working there the day he took that deposit to the bank? <laughs> you know, you know how those tellers count bills. Uh, well, I, 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 I would not recommend it. I wouldn't recommend that at all. Well, still staying with 1923. I, uh, you folks are in San Francisco, but you probably know that New York City has always claimed to be the fashion capital of the country. So naturally they have a, an awful lot of fashion shows and related events. And since I was there uh, doing the, the follies, well, I, I was called on in 1923 to speak at a banquet at the Waldorf, I, the fanciest hotel in, in the whole city <laughs> to a group. And you, you won't believe, uh, I bet you'd never guess in the world uh, what this group was. <laughs> It was the corset manufacturers. Now, now imagine me being asked to speak at a corset dinner. <laughs> so sometimes this after dinner speaking just calls on a fellow to learn something about articles that uh, no self-respecting man has any business knowing about. Now, I, I'm not I'm not complaining. I was mighty glad to appear at a dinner given by an essential industry. Now, uh, just. Just imagine if you can, if the excess flesh of this country was allowed to wander around promiscuously, why <clears throat> there ain't no telling where it would wind up. <clears throat> you see, uh, <laughs> when, our, when our human bodies get beyond their own control, why sometimes we have to call on some mechanical force to try to uh, bring them back to, to at least resemble a uh, human frame. Now, of course it's coming off number of different models and configurations. They all start out the same way. You, you stretch out the string you, as far as you can, and then you step into it. Um, and uh, with a lot of uh, holding your breath and a conservative intake of the diaphragm, why uh, you arrange yourself in inside it. Now, all right, if I was there in person, we would be demonstrating two different styles of, of corsets. Uh, one kind is the back lace. That's also known as a one-man corset. So I'd have one of you guys sitting on a chair behind me and pulling on the strings. Uh, yeah, all, all pretending, obviously. And then we also, the second kind that we demonstrate, we also have the side lace. And that is made in case you're extra fleshy and you need two accomplices to help you congregate yourself. Uh, again, if I was there in person, I'd, you know, I'd probably ask for Fripp and Christine Torrington to help me with that one. <laughs> uh, and then after, after I gave a, a small gift to uh, each of these three volunteers, then I would continue by saying, uh, you know, these corset builders might not do a whole lot to help civilization, but they are a tremendous aid to the eyesight. Uh, of course, there is one potential hazard with corsets. It's the fear of every fleshy lady. And that's the broken corset string. Um, I sat next to a catastrophe 
of this nature one time. It was at a big banquet. We were up at the head table. We didn't even know it at first. The deluge came on so gradual till finally the gentleman on the other side of her and myself, we were just gradually pushed right off our chairs. <laughs> but but that, just, that just shows you how great these corsets are because that lady had come to the dinner in a small roadster and she was delivered home in a bus. <laughs> Well, I, I felt sorry for her. The, the, the deluge <laughs> ripped a few buttons off of her beautiful dress. Now, Patricia will know this and the other speak. I, I embellished that story a little bit. Uh, all humorous do that. <laughs> Actually, her husband drove her home in her Model T Ford. Now, would you believe it? About two years ago, the same thing uh, happened to a friend of mine. Uh, not, not as catastrophic. Uh, her husband, Jack, <laughs> told me about it this past January. Uh, Sharon, that's, that's her name. Uh, Sharon has a favorite corset from her wedding day and uh, she would wear it on special occasions. And she had dealt with broken corset strings before, but this one, this one when it broke, that was just the last straw. And you know, they just don't make corset strings the way they used to. <laughs> anyway. She said, I'm finished with that corset. And then she told Jack that she wanted a change. She wanted a change. Well, Jack told me that right there, he made the worst blunder of his married life. He said, cheerfully, I told her, great, I'll buy you a Peloton. Oh, well, after picking himself up off the floor, <laughs> Well, not really. She would, she would never do that to him. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, Jack found out that she was not thinking about exercise equipment. Instead, she wanted a modern version of a corset, and uh, she hinted that Jack should consider buying her a gift from Spanx, S-P-A-N-X. <laughs> All right. Let, let me step away from the Sharon and Jack for a moment <laughs> and, and tell you a little bit more. Um, you know, audiences in, enjoy this uh, corset story uh, that I tell from 1923. And uh, I decided, well, I need to find out what corsets look like, you know, today. Um, I'd heard of Spanx. I, it's a great company. I, I think it was founded about 10 years ago. Tremendous business. So anyway, I, I went on spanks.com and searched for courses. All right, gentlemen, I do not recommend this. Um, they don't sell corsets. They sell shapewear. And, and anything of any shape a woman might wear under her clothes, they sell it. It's... It's kind of a cross between Ace Hardware and Victoria's Secret. <laughs> well, and they have sizes all the way from extra small, uh, small, medium, large, XL, 2XL. Um, but I was, I was wondering, if you're extra small, do you really need a, any suck-it-in underwear? Um, and, and, and ladies... <laughs> Do you order the size you are or the size you want to be after you squeeze yourself into it? Uh, but but I, I tell you, I admire you. Us men like it when you look slim and trim. And we really appreciate that every morning you're willing to go through self-inflicted torture to do it. <laughs> well, no, on that website, I read a review by one woman. She said, I give this product a thumbs up, but initially I couldn't get the damn thing on. <laughs> she said with, uh, with pulling and squeezing, I finally managed. Um, see the difference is with a, with a side lace corset, you can have two accomplices to, uh, to help you, but with Spanx, you're on your own. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's kind of like pulling one of those small kids blow up balloons over a watermelon. Well, by the way, Spanx.com has a section for men. Uh, 
now Colin might be interested in this, <laughs> but, uh, but guys, I tell you, if you're standing in a bar with a couple of buddies and one of them says, you know, I really like my BVDs. And, and the other one turns and said, well, my favorite is Haynes. What's yours? <laughs> Spanks? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, before I lose you, let me, let me get back to the sh tell you about Sharon and Jack. Uh, two years ago, Sharon said that Spanx, uh, she told Jack, that's only a temporary fix. And that she wanted to go on a diet and look more like Marie Osmond. And by golly, she did it. And, uh, and she did it. She did it without a Peloton. So congratulations to her. <laughs> All right, well, <clears throat> I better get on the politics. You know that I enjoy talking about politics and here it's only two weeks before the election. Now, when I told my great, great grandson, Mason, who lived down in Bakersfield, that I'd be speaking at a breakfast in San Francisco, he said, oh, you better be careful because that's the center of politics here in California. Um, and you've got, got you got you guys you folks have both senators one of them's running for vice president you got the speaker of the house you got a former mayor willie brown um you might be interested to know that that i knew james roth jr who was your mayor for 20 years and then became governor now i'm uh, <laughs> as i get into politics i'm not concerned about you throwing any rotten eggs at me by, by state law, all California eggs have to come from free range chickens and they're so expensive you can't afford to waste one on a bum comedian. So, besides any, anything I say is in, in fun. I never attack anybody personally, uh, even if you think they deserve it. Well, I'm, I'm just an old country boy living in a big town trying to get along and I've been eating pretty regular and, the reason I have been is because I've stayed an old country boy. Now, I get over to Washington once in a while to check on the old joke factory. <laughs> that, that's Congress to you folks. Now, you probably know I don't write any political jokes. Nope, I, I just watch the government and report the facts. <laughs> it's, uh, don't even have to exaggerate. Uh, there's, there's, just, there's just no trick to being a humorist when you have the whole government working for you. All right, before I get into any deeper into politics, I, I wanna get one thing clear with you folks. I'm, I don't belong to any organized political party. <clears throat> I'm a Democrat, uh, but, <laughs> but really I don't, I don't take sides with anybody politically. I, I kid those folks, but, uh, but I know they all get in there and they do the best they can. And none of them from any party are, uh, are going to ruin the country or the states well, at least not on purpose. Um, well, you might be interested in a couple of the things that I learned from listening to these birds over the years, and I'll just I'll just share two of them with you now. And if and if we time have time later in the Q and A section, I I can come back and share a few more if you want. Well, anyway, here's here's one. The greatest traits of a Democrat is optimism and humor. <clears throat> you got to be an optimist to be a Democrat, and <laughs> you got to be a humorous to stay one. Now, the Democrats and Republicans are equally corrupt uh, where money's concerned. It's only in the amount where the Republicans excel. Well, let me, I better get off politics and back to civilization because there's nothing in common, nothing in common between those two at all. Um, a fellow asked me a while back, he said, uh, Will, what constitutes a life well spent? Well, I think that love and admiration from your fellow men is all anybody can ask for. Now, I, I would never pretend to tell somebody else how to live their life, but the words that I try to follow myself is this, uh, live your life so that when you lose it, you're ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about money. <laughs> you folks know it's better to, than being broke, it, to have money. Um, now, what I'm talking about is the important things in life, uh, things like um, friends, uh, integrity, compassion, mm. generosity. Well, speaking of friends, a few years a few years ago, I heard Charlie Jarvis, speaker from down in Texas, and 
and uh, I, I know Fripp knows him. He's deceased now. But anyway, in a speech, he said, uh, one thing about friends, when you die, you want to make sure you've got at least six of them. <clears throat> well, when I die, my epitaph or whatever those words are that you see on gravestones is going to read, I joked about every prominent man of my time, but I never met a man I didn't like. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of that. I can hardly wait to die. <laughs> so, so it can be carved. And when you come around my grave out in Carmore, Oklahoma, well, you'll find me sitting there proudly reading it. Um, I never met a man I didn't like. Now, uh, of course, if I was saying that today, Fripp, I would say I never met a person I didn't like. Uh, the, the key word is, is met, met. I never met a person I didn't like. If you give everybody a fair first chance to be a, to be decent, to be a friend, then people start liking you. And when people like you, well, things start looking up. Your, your whole world will look a whole lot brighter. And I think if you follow that philosophy of, I never met a person I didn't like, uh, you'll likely have all the love and admiration that you can handle. All right, coming back to what I said at the beginning, Here's a key point. Now, after you meet a person, if you find out he's a scoundrel or a crook or a communist dictator, uh, you don't have to keep liking him. Uh, that's, that's the difference. <laughs> okay. I feel every speaker, and I know the others that you have on, on Wednesday mornings, uh, leave you plenty of worthwhile tips, but I'm just going to leave one, one with you here this morning. It's an economic plan. It's a plan to end all plans and it'll work for you no matter who's in the White House or up in Sacramento. Uh, here it is. Don't gamble. Take all your savings and buy some good stock and hold it till it goes up and then sell it. If it don't go up, don't buy it. <laughs> well, get a, get a few laughs and do the best you can. Uh, you have a great organization here. And maybe we, maybe we can meet in person sometime if I live to be 150 years old. <laughs> All right. That's it. Let's go back to you, Craig. Oh my God. <laughs> Randall, that, that was awesome. <laughs> or should I say Will Rogers? Will Rogers, that was awesome. Yeah. But, and if I may say, Mr. President, who is this Will Rogers? He's, our, as you heard, our pal Randall Reader. As Will Rogers, he gives talks to businesses and organizations all across the country. I know he's a popular with Menza. <laughs> For 32 years, wow. Randall was on the faculty at Ohio State University as an extension agricultural engineer. My alma mater. Yeah. <laughs> Great. He's been a member of NSA for over 30 years. His website, willrogerstoday.com. He writes a weekly column in Will Rogers style, and he'll happily put you on his email list if you'd like. He also posts them on Facebook. I subscribe to many of my friends' newsletters. When Randall come, come in every Sunday night, I stop all the priorities to read what he has to say. What mm -hmm. Will Rogers said, and as it ties into what's going on today, is unbelievable. You mm -hmm. get a true appreciation of how wise he was. So if I may ask the first question, Randall, I believe when you first went to the National Speakers Association, you weren't Will Rogers. So tell us that, what, were you, what was your interest in NSA, your speaking before you went there and had that fateful conversation that changed your career? Yeah. Well, it was the second convention that I went to in Orlando, National Speaker Association and a prominent speaker from Oklahoma saw me and the first words out of his mouth were, you gotta be Will Rogers. Uh, and uh, I didn't have the hat, my hair didn't even look like this, but, but uh, and I've outlived Will. So I look 
more like him 25 years ago than I do now, but that's what got me into it. And uh, in, in my work at Ohio State, I was talking on such exciting topics as soil compaction and <laughs> farming. So, uh, so I was open to ideas on things to become a little bit more interesting. As a speaker. That, that's how I got into it. So Trip is right. It was at an NSA convention that, that I was discovered as Will Rogers, and I've been doing this on the side since. And I started, speaking of the writing, the weekly comments, I think I'm up to number 133 was the one I wrote this past, excuse me, 1,033 <laughs> that I wrote this past uh, past weekend. And it is fun. Uh, and she's right. There's always something that Will had to say, uh, basically about elections and politics. But just life in general. In fact, so many things <clears throat> he wrote about agriculture. And since I'm in agriculture, I, that's the reason I uh, compiled the book. I can't say I wrote it. I, I compiled it of, uh, of all of his writings. Nice. Hey, um, Randall, um, uh, we've got uh, a comment from Craig Harrison here. He says, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Um, and, go ahead. I just like to comment. Do you realize what confidence it takes to be a humorist? Are we still on to meet at Market of Choice for breakfast at nine a.m.? Question mark. I have oh, no idea what that was. I, I don't know what that. What I was going to say. Do you realize the confidence it takes to be a humorist in a Zoom meeting where <laughs> everybody's <laughs> muted? <laughs> it's one thing to deliver content that is serious so thumbs up for that and i will now <laughs> shut up and let uh, and let other people ask their questions <laughs> and i let me comment this is the first totally virtual one i've done i, I did an interview uh with brian wagner who's on here my friend from about a couple of miles away from me uh, and interview is quite a bit easier that was on Will Rogers and leadership tips from Will and his friends like Henry Ford and FDR. But, but just going through this 30 minutes, it was hard to see any reaction. Obviously, I didn't hear any reaction. So, so you just have to, and I've done these all these stories enough that I know where the laughs are supposed to be. <laughs> so you just pause accordingly and, and hope that I haven't put, haven't put people to sleep. No way. That was really other fun. questions. You were great. I was just I was laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, you know, and I have to say, Randall, I really appreciated that, um, you know, you've kept the spirit of Will Rogers alive, but you also were able to modernize them, you know, and relate what's mm -hmm. happening today with your presentation and still keep the spirit alive. I thought that was really well played. And, um, you know, thank you so much for for doing that. Well, well, thank you. I, I discovered really quick that if I just did it as a historical character, like, like other people do it. Uh, they know nothing that happened after the day their character died. So I wouldn't know anything that happened after uh, 1935. Um, and I, I found out real quick, I just couldn't do that. So I had, I had heard James Whitmore, who was the best Will Rogers, he did a show and fabulous. And I noticed that once in a while he would throw in <laughs> modern comments. So that gave me kind of a license to do the same. And, and it's fun to keep up with situations today. I like Will Rogers, I, I, I don't read three or four newspapers like he did, <laughs> but uh, he was famous and his shows, whether it was 10 minutes or whether he was given an hour or a two hour speech, that he was always talking about things that happened that day. And uh, he was <laughs> even made a comment that sometimes when he was on the Ziegfeld Follies for 10 minutes that, that uh, he was ahead of the audience, that he, <laughs> he saw things, read things in the newspaper that they hadn't read yet. So it just makes it a lot more interesting. I think it's, it's that's yeah it's um, it's more relatable. 
Oh, what other questions do we have? I think Anastasia has a question. Yes, quick one. I just want to ask, um, first off, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I see you have books behind you. How can we get your book instead of paying $930 for the only hard copy on Amazon? <laughs> well, it's it's $15 and I'm very civil. I send them out myself. Amazon doesn't have any of the books. Uh, awesome. So, that means you can sign it. Yay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, so um, I'll be... I'm late for an appointment. I have to run out, but can someone maybe put it in the chat or I can follow up with you, Craig, and get that information? Yeah. yeah. Let me, I'll give you, I'll give you my address and you can just send me 15 bucks and I, that, that's the retail price of the book. And okay. I'll just turn right around, sign it and put it in an envelope for you. Well, I'm happy to at least pay for your shipping. So um, yeah, I'll get that oh, yeah. information later then. So I, uh, bye everybody, gotta run late. Right. Take care, bye. thank you again. Okay, yeah, I gotta run too, thanks. Right, see you, Colin. Uh, yeah, if you guys, you know, it, we, if you have some more questions, what, it, you go ahead and stick around. Um, Randall, are you gonna be able to stay for a little bit longer? Oh yeah, yep. Um, I'll be here. I'm I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'll I'll stay as long as you want to. I don't have anything else scheduled today. I have a question. Was Will Rogers married? Yes. What that, was she like? Oh, uh, they uh, they knew each other for eight years before they got married. Um, and I joke, I tell it this: they were both 29 years old when they got married, and I said. And you could ask the question, well, in that eight years, didn't either one of them decide to get married, uh, want to get married? And my funny answer is, well, yeah, but not at the same time. <laughs> so, uh, it, and, and Will, I tell you, okay, I'll speak as Randall now. Uh, Will gave Betty full credit for turning him into a reasonable common sense business person she was the business behind it and, and she managed the family and <laughs> helped him uh, straighten out will, will was fine but he wasn't a good manager of money <laughs> but uh, so she took care of it and they had um, four kids all together will jr was born in uh, 1911 mary their only daughter two years later and then uh, jimmy in 1915 um, and they had another son, uh, Freddie, uh, born in 1918, but he, uh, he died two years later um, out in California. So three of them that grew up to adulthood and, and, uh, and had professional careers of their own. Does that, that help you out? Yeah, he gave, Thank you. He gave Betty full credit. He's, on, on Mother's Day, he said, uh, the, the mother and, and it, Will's own mother died when he was 10. He had older sisters that helped take care of him. But, uh, but back to <laughs> on a Mother's Day, Will, Will wrote that uh, I give credit to the best mother, um, to Betty, because she raised to adulthood three, three young'uns, one by three by birth and one by marriage. <laughs> Now I did. Sorry, Craig. Oh, you know, well, Randall. Yeah, I had a, a comment and a question. Uh, you know, as speakers, we're always warned about subjects like religion and politics, and yet the nature of of Will's shtick is politics. So, I very much appreciated that you did a little customization and you you referenced California and San Francisco, uh, and I am curious. Um, does it ever get rancorous? Um, do, do you ever do your good natured humor and then people take it further or things happen in your audience when you have sort of a mixed audience of, of especially in these politically charged times uh, this year and, and of late? Uh, thanks, Greg. I've, I've never, no, I've never run into that. And uh, I, I think I mentioned, I make it clear that I am balanced so I'm very careful to choose various quotes that, yeah, makes fun of Democrats or another one will make fun of Republicans. And, and, uh, and Will Rogers, he made fun of presidents. He poked fun at Congress senators. Uh, he did it in such a way that they all laughed. They loved him. They even made him an honorary congressman. 
<laughs> but he's, yeah. he was, it, there's a way to do it, Craig. Uh, and I, I tell you, I'm, I'm not going to pick on the late night humor. I think Johnny Carson was great. Um, but I think the ones today, uh, and I don't even listen to them anymore, but I, I, I think so many of the humorous are so one-sided that they just turn off half their audience. And Will had a, had a knack. Uh, if I was doing it myself as Randall Reader, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be that skillful, but uh, Will could do it. And as I said, he, he, he let everybody know <clears throat> that he was, he was in fun, he was having fun. Uh, he uh, gave a funny story about uh, Calvin Coolidge when Coolidge was president. And, and uh, anyway, it just, it just goes over great. And they all buy books, unless you alienate <laughs> them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So Randall um, was Will Rogers, he was syndicated. So, I mean, yes. is that so was that really the secret to his success financially? Uh, well, the, the syndicated newspaper columns, uh, he had a daily, what he called the daily telegram. That's what it's referred to now because he sent it in by telegram. I think it was four o'clock New York time. Uh, and it would be in the newspapers the next day. Uh, and he'd write six of those a week. Then he the weekly article I actually started with the weekly articles first think of op-ed page in your sunday paper uh, that kind of a column the, the daily telegram were just short uh, usually two or three paragraphs uh, but uh, all that writing uh, so he, the weekly articles began in 1923 the daily telegrams uh, those in the newspaper were 1927 um, he was making silent movies. He made silent, 20 silent movies all together starting in 1918. Yeah. He, he, moved, uh, he moved with the movie folks from New Jersey to Hollywood uh, back there around 1918, 1919. And uh, he was not, he was just average in the silent movies. But when the talkies began, that's when that's when Will was in his prime talking. And, uh, and you know, some of the silent movie stars who were fantastic when they didn't have to talk, started talking. Like, they might sound like this. And uh, uh, they just dropped out. But Will was in his prime. And he was the highest paid actor in uh, 1934 and would have been in 1935. And when he died, all right, I'll uh, let you guess. Who do you think? replaced him in 1935-36 as the highest paid actor in Hollywood. Uh, Roy Rogers? No. no. Ronald Reagan? Roy came later. Shirley Temple. Uh -huh. <laughs> Shirley Temple. Uh, and uh, they never made a movie together. There's a couple of pictures I have of them, of them together. Anyway, did it, uh, I hope that answered the question. I forget what the question was. Now. <laughs> okay. Good. now, Randall, I'd like to know, as an agricultural engineer, what what did you teach in that area? I worked in uh, agricultural machinery, tractors, okay. mines. And I was an extension worked in the cooperative extension service, uh, 4-H, you probably know, was part of the cooperative extension service. The headquarters in California is at UC Davis, and I know a couple of people there. Uh, and then I, I was working mainly, and even since I retired nine years ago, I still work with no-till farmers. That just means you don't plow. <laughs> you just have a have corn planters and, and grain drills today that will work right through a, a field that is left just like it was last last fall or this fall um, and uh, it saves saves erosion it saves money reduces fuel use eliminate eliminates things like the dust bowl that that i that will rogers lived lived through and, and talked about so that's what i did um, and i i only taught a class and by golly, I'm glad I 
retired when I did because I, I just hate having to teach like it is today, virtual or a combination. Uh, it's hard to imagine. How do you, how do you teach engineers <laughs> uh, virtual? <laughs> yeah, you do something, but you just, you just gotta have some labs. And I know in our department, uh, they, they still have in-person labs there. I was there the other day and they were teaching surveying out, outside. So that, that answer your question, Tripp? Yeah, very good. Hey, Jay Randall, Randall, Randall uh, if you uh, Randall, if you could repeat your uh, website and your email. Ah, all right. The email is very simple. It's Will Rogers at AOL dot com. Some people wonder, you're still on AOL? Well, <laughs> if you had the email Will Rogers at AOL, you'd keep it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I'll go ahead and give you a phone number if you want that too. 614 477 0439. And well, may as well go ahead and give you the address that you're going to put on the chats, I guess. Um, I, I live at 4779 Baldwin Road. That's B A L D W I N. And the town is Hilliard, H-I-L-L-I-A-R-D, uh, Ohio. Yeah, Brian's got the same address, Hilliard, uh, Hilliard, Ohio, uh, 43026. And to repeat something in response to a question earlier, uh, you just mail me a $15 check and I'll send you a signed book. <laughs> Glad to do it. And by the way, we've been showing the cover, but let me show you what it looked like on the inside. These are quotes by, and it's chronological, so that was 1931, uh, but it's it's big print, and, and I wrote this for old farmers, <laughs> so that's the reason they can they can read it without without squinting. So. And I just put the website in the chat. Will Rogers today. Will Rogers today. Dot com. You bet. Right. And if, I, I tell you, Will Rogers dot com. That's the Will Rogers Memorial in uh, Claremore, Oklahoma. And they've got some things uh, also there about the Will Rogers Ranch, which is now uh, in Pacific Palisades there near Santa Monica. Um, and that's uh, Will Rogers State. What do they call it? The State Historical Park. And then there's the, the Will Rogers Beach, which, believe it or not, Will Rogers owned, I think it was three quarters of a mile of the beach. <laughs> and, uh, oh, wow, can you imagine owning that and what it would be worth if he actually sold it? Mm -hmm. anyway, anyway, that's, that's on, the, on the website. And, and besides my website of Will Rogers today, um, if you want to learn more. And uh, I've got a lot of quotes on there. Uh, quotes about politics. So at the top of the website, uh, there's a list of different things. And uh, quotes is one word. You click on quotes and then you'll see uh, there's eight or nine different topics. There's quotes on business, quotes on lawyers, real estate. You got some real estate folks here. Uh, inspirational quotes. And then um, all my weekly comment, I think almost all of them are, are on there if you want to Really, go way back to 1997. I think is when I started writing the weekly comments. And and Mr. President, you sent out a magnificent photograph last night with your mailing a Randall with Will Rogers statue behind that was a classic. Thank you, thank you. We try to we try to get the word out through various sources, you know, uh, the company, the, the club websites are social networking and independent stuff. So, um, yeah, that was she, Patricia's referring to a picture of Randall of holding a what is a saddlebag, I guess. And then the lasso. Yeah. Um, have you have you learned any lasso tricks? <laughs> I do. Uh, I do. I do one. Uh, I do a flat loop. I joke about it. That's what, that's what you'd learn the 
first day of kindergarten in roping school. Yeah. Uh, I used to do what's called the wedding ring, but then I hurt my shoulder and I don't even try that anymore. But Will was fantastic. If you haven't watched the rope and fool on YouTube, uh, I tell you, you just gotta, gotta do that. Will used, he was really creative. Um, he had slow motion movie. This was, I think, 1922 or 23 when he did this. He wanted to do it before he got so old he couldn't do the rope tricks anymore. Uh, so the movie was just simply to showcase his roping skills. And uh, there's a couple of them that he does with a horse uh, throwing three lassos or throwing it so it roped the front legs from behind the horse as it ran by him. It's just unbelievable and it's and all of these many of them are in slow motion because he said people wouldn't believe it if it was just regular speed so slow motion photography was brand new back then they also whitewashed the ropes so you could see them clearly <laughs> a lot of these techniques uh, fantastic well, I, I watched that after you told me, Randall, and it is it is amazing. It's well worth grab a cup of coffee and sit back and watch. <laughs> I've got I've got it queued up on my my computer. I'm going to see it afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got a quick question for you because you know um, Will Rogers was what a quarter Cherokee? You said yes, one quarter Cherokee. One quarter. And he was he was he was from Oklahoma. I mean, so I, how did you know he, he never mentions at least I've never heard any mention of Indian heritage from Will Rogers quotes, but um, I mean, how did uh, that affect him? It was that, you know, what oh, was his... uh, Craig, he was very proud to be a Cherokee and, and he talked about it different times. Uh, he would say, I, I hope my Cherokee blood isn't making me prejudiced. <laughs> but he's, got, he's got, he's got some great lines about Thanksgiving pilgrims uh in fact i'll i'm sure i'll post that again i post it every year thanksgiving time <laughs> and uh one of the lines was uh if uh, uh <laughs> the pilgrim always uh, uh, he always had a, a a gun beside him and if he wanted to <laughs> this this will sound bad in today's environment so <laughs> so don't be offended by it but he said uh, if if a pillar, if he wanted to get uh, get more land, he'd just go out and shoot another Indian, and uh, and uh, he would um, he had had to had to buy powder, but of course he would get the uh, get the lead back when he dissected the Indian. <laughs> so, but it, yeah, I can see Christine reacting to that. But uh, he just he just told these things in such a way that everybody laughed at him, and. Uh, I, I, Today, oh geez, you might have to tone down a little bit. But, and he was they, 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 they'd also uh, make sure that a, a school is never named after him in San Francisco. <laughs> oh geez, well, all this, and I've joked about this with uh, um, the Speaker of the House uh, Pelosi uh, getting rid or covering up statues of, sla of any slave owners or mm -hmm. any connected with the South in the Civil War. <laughs> Most of you know, one of those statues is right there in front of the main entrance to the House of Representatives. Uh, when Will found out they were gonna put a, Oklahoma wanted one of their two statues to be of him, uh, instead of being in the rotunda where most of the statues are, he said, well, if you're gonna do it, uh, put me out uh, right there where I can keep an eye on, on Congress. So his, his statue is right there in, in front of the main entrance to the house. And it's in a wide hallway. And you see it, you see that statue very often because that's where the TV cameras, uh, you know, anymore, it seemed like the news cameras are usually set up in the rotunda up on the second level. Yeah. But for a long time, they were all in that wide hallway and Will Rogers statue was always right behind the senator or the congressman who were speaking. And uh, so that was, that, that's interesting too. Uh, well, do we have any other questions for Randall? 
Hey, let me, uh, let, uh, yeah, let me mention something quickly. That, that corset story, and I tell you, uh, you folks that know Patricia Fripp personally, and I've known her, like I said, about 25 years in NSA, she is so helpful. She helped me pull this together and encouraged me on those, my opening about San Francisco. And then uh, the corset story, uh, I was trying to come up with, and normally it just, my, my story ends with the lady that, uh, she, she came in a small roadster and she was delivered home on a bus. And I started thinking about it, uh, that, 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 that's kind of hard. That's kind of harsh to that poor lady. It was funny. <laughs> Oh, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny, but it's nice in a story. And I've learned a little bit more about this three acts and it's, you have conflict at the beginning. Of course, the conflict in that story was Will Rogers having to learn about corsets, <laughs> but then in, in the act, you like to resolve the problem and then, then make a hero of somebody else. Well, if I'm making fun of this fat lady, uh, I'm not really making her a hero. So, uh, and Patricia helped me with this story. I hope she uh, kind of liked what I really came up with and finished with. If you got any comments on it, of course, when I said, uh, would you believe that two years ago, the same thing happened to a friend of mine? Uh, well, that's a made up story, uh, but it gave me an opportunity there to come up with a story where that woman uh, two years later after dieting and it, it let me get Spanx <laughs> into the story too. <laughs> and uh, that, that's just so funny. I tell you, when I got on the website, I thought, oh my golly, <laughs> what else on here? <laughs> but, uh, and those, the quote that I said of the woman that said, uh, I, I give you a thumbs up, but uh, <laughs> she couldn't hardly get in it. So that, that, I, I think uh, maybe you guys, I hope you guys agree with this. There's just so much humor in, in the, the Spanx idea. Yeah. I, I like the part where you're talking about the, in the bar, you know, and yeah. the guy, you know, what yeah. kind of, yeah, it's like, that was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I didn't realize there was Spanx for men. But however, yeah. it makes perfect sense to expand your market if you got it. Yeah, but I, I was telling Randall, you know, I, I wear some, I call it my sucky in underwear, you know, just <laughs> lightens it up and firms it. But it is a very interesting question. Do you buy the size you are or the size <laughs> you want to be? Because I said, I bought some that I can't get into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And I don't know, what did, did you like? There, we got a tornado siren just outside my, in the corner of our yard, believe it or not. So uh, it, it's, it's going to be loud here for a couple of minutes. Well, it's, so it's what five, is the siren telling you? It's noon. It's noon. Oh, it's, it's a test every Wednesday at noon here. Oh, okay. Here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that was... We're not going to go. see flames behind you. Right? No. <laughs> it's it's just a, a weekly test that they do to make sure it works. <laughs> so okay. so on, on that, I'm not paying, it's it, I'm not paying attention. It really wakes me up. So, uh, I'm good at the what is <laughs> the line when I that it's uh, it's kind of like pulling one of those blow up balloons over a watermelon. <laughs> That, that, that was very good. And as I said to Randall, this is one of the reasons you speak for free. You practice some new content in. That's the benefit. There's no free engagement because you make new friends, but it also gives you a chance to try out new material. However, you know, being, being a humorist in Zoom takes a lot of guts. So, Thank you. I'm glad the Breakfast Club was your your first. Ver I didn't realize it was your first virtual presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Randall. I appreciate you helping out my club. And Mr. President, I am now going to run to my speechwriters professional speechwriters conference. So. Mm -hmm.
See you all, all right. next week. And don't forget, Michael Haig and your instructions will be introduce yourself with how you have helped one person in a couple of sentences. Thanks, Perfect. Randall. Bye, guys. Right. Bye, Derek. Bye, everybody. Have a great right. day. Yeah, Thank keep, you, Randall. Awesome job. Keep, yeah, keep inviting me. Thank you. I, I definitely hope to be with you on November the 4th. Oh, I hope so, too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, need, we'll need some good laughs. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. Bye bye. Looking forward to the book. <laughs> bye bye.